and, and thanks everyone for staying on to the bitter end. This is good. Um, I, I have to say, um, I just sat in on Jonathan Ponger's uh, little session, and he gave me an amazing tip. Um, it was in fact, it was during the general election campaign. I have to say this to Stuart now, because he's not an active Tory politician anymore. <laughs> um, and I was thinking, actually, you know, uh, this Mark Cook guy who's Tory candidate was getting quite a few followers on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I haven't actually, I opened a Twitter account about a year previously and had never tweeted because so I couldn't quite encourage up, you know, build up the confidence to actually do this. I'm thinking I feel a bit ridiculous. And Jonathan just said, there's one thing you can do that will instantly get you sort of shooting upwards on Twitter. And it's if you follow everyone who follows you. I only had about four people, I thought this isn't going to work. Um, but I started doing it and I did a couple of tweets and that got a few more followers and then I started following them as well. And I think I'd overtaken Mark Coop within one week yeah. and went on 3,000 in counting. So, Jonathan, I have to say, uh, I'm sure you pay for the advice. I bought him a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, he does give away tips far too easily for his business, but anyway. Um, but actually, I'm sure his, his pay for consultancy is really worth having. Um, and I have an example of um, the equivalent of his giraffe bread story. Um, not a three and a half year old, sadly. I've never been yet quite lobbied by a three and a half year old. I have been lobbied by a 10 year old though, and this is quite a good story of why it is actually still worth lobbying your local MP and even backbenchers and even opposition MPs, though I wasn't done, uh, can exercise some influence and do some good. Um, Jake Batty was uh, actually at my daughter's school, Beckhampton Primary, and he was obsessed with sharks. He loved collecting pictures of sharks, he knew all about sharks, he watched TV programmes on sharks, and he watched one TV programme that talked about how shark finning, which is the, this awful practice of slicing the fin off the shark, taking the fin and just letting the shark lead to death, basically, and wasting the whole of the rest of the, the animal, um, was still prevalent in some British controlled waters, even though it had been technically outlawed by the uh, European Union. And so it was to do with the sort of interaction with British ships and British waters and this kind of thing. There was a loophole, basically. And he told his mum and his mum uh, caught me in the playground and said, what do you know about sharks? And I said, you know, big fun things, you know, teeth at one end, that's about it, really. Um, and she said, well, you know, Jake's got something to tell you. And he told me about this issue. And I said, well, okay, I don't know much about this, but I'll go and find out. It seems serious to me. Uh, I phoned up, I found an organisation called the Shark Trust, which I didn't even know existed, and said, is this right? You know, and they said, well, actually, yeah, we've been lobbying on it, but we can't get much traction with politicians. So we put down an early day motion, we wrote to ministers, and the policy changed. And we were able to take, we eventually took Jake up to the House of Commons, did a presentation with the Shark Trust, <laughs> saying actually anyone can change the law, really. Uh, and this 10 year old, through a playground contact and a, watching a tele program, had just managed to influence the way things work. Now, early day motions, I have to say, are a strange thing. They, early day means they're debated on the earliest day available, which is never. Uh, literally never. <laughs> so they are just a published motion and they're a way of expressing interest in something and there are thousands of them. Some people are so sceptical about them they, don't, they refuse to sign them altogether. Uh, but actually they do, they get noticed by civil servants as in this case they get noticed by a government department who thinks, who actually is a bit of a spotlight being shone on this now, we better do something. Um, and they've raised publicity for, for campaigns. And they are just one of the tools that are available for people. You can write to ministers, you can have face-to-face -face meetings with ministers, you can obviously raise things actually in the house, you can make, ask oral questions which put ministers immediately on the spot. Don't get quality answers but can sometimes embarrass them into uh, trying to find out what the subject's about. Or you can get things called adjournment debates where you raise a specific subject or you can... There's a whole variety of, of ways you can use your position and of course you can talk to the media either locally or, or nationally. And sometimes you can write to institutions other than ministers. And a lot of what I do as an MP is writing to people like Charlton Borough Council, or Gloucestershire County Council, or the police, or the NHS. Um, and it shouldn't work, of course. Everybody should get the same response when they write to the police or to the council. But there is some magic about having that little green portcullis at the top of your letterpad uh, that does seem to, unfortunately, have some kind of impact and make people sit up and take notice in a way they wouldn't do other ones. So in all these kind of ways, um, MPs have a role. Now, it used to be there were two great things that you discovered when you got elected as an MP. Uh, one was the expenses system, <laughs> and the other was the fact that we had no job description. 
The expenses thing, that ran into trouble. <laughs> so that's not such good news now. It's very tight, and I think actually that's an entirely good thing, and it's completely transparent, and you can't buy moats and castles and things like this. Um, but the no job description side, uh, that's still true. So actually, there is no limit, really, on what an MP can take up. There's no rule, really, that says, um, this is appropriate and this isn't appropriate, or you know, I shouldn't do this or I shouldn't take up that course. So as far as business is concerned, I think that's an opportunity. Now, there are some traditions. Uh, clearly, there are some traditional roles that an MP plays. You are a legislator. You have to turn up and vote on legislation. Uh, you generally have to take the party whip, although in the Lib Dem case, that's fairly soft, actually. Uh, and if you have a disagreement on principle, you know, ultimately you are accountable more to your constituents than you are to your party. You do take up lots of individual casework, and people who are resident in your constituency can come to you on a one-to-one -one basis. And I hold Friday evening surgeries at which that happens, uh, and certainly business people are quite welcome, uh, quite welcome to come to those as well. And my rule tends to be, I mean, there is a strict rule about not taking up other constituents' business, uh, sorry, other MPs' constituents' business. So if somebody lives somewhere else, you shouldn't really take up that case. You should pass it on to their local MP. But uh, if a business is based in Cheltenham, if lots of people work for that business who come from Cheltenham, uh, if even if the people aren't from Cheltenham, the business is, I think I work for that, that business as well as for my individual constituents, and I'm quite happy to take up issues for a business on that basis. Um, and you also, obviously, you are an elected representative of your town or your area, so I think you should be there to take up campaigning issues. Um, so whether it's something like the maternity ward, or the future of the uh, children's ward, or the, uh, whether or not the swim into Kemble line needs redoubling, these kind of things, um, you're quite free to take those kind of issues up and uh, to campaign on them in whatever ways possible. Now, in the process of doing all those things, I generally do talk to businesses anyway. I go and visit local businesses. I talk to people like well, like Chelton Connects uh, Business Group occasionally. Um, to the Gloucestershire Chamber on things like you know whether or not rents are too high in Cheltenham still. Are landlords actually um, bringing down rents to reflect the recession, or are they just happy to keep these lots of places open, which doesn't seem to hurt their portfolios much, but does hurt businesses locally and hurts the town because it makes it look as though uh, you know, we've got empty spaces. With the Cheltenham Chamber, I've taken up issues on things like ultra light rail, which Mike Ratcliffe is very uh, keen to push, and which I think has a, a very promising future in the town, but it's a long-term project, that. On, uh, with the local economic partnership, the LEP, um, that's early days yet, but I think Diane Savory is providing fantastic leadership for that. Um, and David Owen is, is very good as well, so I think there is a promising future for that organisation, but it's, I think, to be fair to it, it's still finding its feet in terms of seizing real economic and investment opportunities uh, for the county. But beyond that, I can still do lots of things for individual businesses as well. And some of it is quite light, fluffy stuff. I don't know why these spring to mind. Uh, maybe if you look at my waistline, you'll understand. But contemporary cake designs, they were opening their, um, their new place in uh, the Mead Road estate. And I went along and did some publicity. And you, know, and you can tweet, and you can uh, get in front of the local paper. And that all helps to, to make people aware of that particular business. Uh, Battle Down Brewery, I remember we were producing a new beer, so I went along and we just had to do that photo call quite a few times. <laughs> um, it was getting worse as you went along, that was the only reason. <laughs> but anyway, we did a nice Christmas photo call and we, we did a, um, a bit of a launch there, that was good. Um, but sometimes it, it's at a much heavier end. Um, I do take up really serious legislative or regulatory blocks on people's businesses. Um, when we had Vince Cable down the other day, he was coming to the Sustainable Moto Expo. Um, I took him to, uh, I took him next door, virtually, actually, to Edward Elgar Publishing, who, if you've never heard of them, are an extraordinary company. Um, real Cheltenham success story, very quiet and discreet sitting in on Lansdowne Road. Uh, but they are one of the world's leading academic publishers. They have a fantastic export business. Uh, which is doing very well through this recession, has managed the transition to e-books and e-publishing um, very well indeed, but they do have issues with um, the way in which exports are handled by the British government with intellectual property issues and things like that. And so I managed to get the Secretary of State, which isn't bad, to sit down with them for half an hour over a coffee and just listen to the, to the issues they had. And we did the same with Nick Clegg when he came to 
Cheltenham, um, he, we took him back to Spire at Sarko, where he said he discovered more about steam than he ever really wanted to know. He was, for weeks afterwards, even in Parliament, he was telling people about the little bit of steam that comes out of a kettle, that that's really the steam, and all the sort of fluffy stuff, that's not steam, that's mm -hmm. condensate. So it really sort of infected him somehow. But they, they when he went into Spirax, they had a line of people who in suits who kind of greeted him, hello, Deputy Prime Minister. We took him across the road to Superdry, uh, where Julian Dunkerton wandered up in his jeans and said, hi, hello, <laughs> uh, do you want a coffee? <laughs> and um, he did, so they sent someone out to Starbucks or something to get a coffee for him. And they ended up just sitting on a table somewhere, you know, talking. And that's fine. And actually, he raised some important issues about support for manufacturing, which we are gonna, gonna pursue as well. So that kind of contact and taking up quite serious legislative and regulatory issues, which are sometimes a block to people's businesses, where you in business can see that a regulation is nonsense, that it's not working the way it was intended, and that you know the process of getting that changed or shifted needs to be unblocked, because if you start talking to the civil servants at the bottom end, it somehow seems to take just years sometimes to get these things changed. Sometimes, if you have that direct route and that connection to a minister or to a senior politician, you can get it moved a bit faster. Um, and I'll represent what I see as the business interest sometimes on issues like uh, a local council issue, like parking in Montpellier, which is something that I'm so passionate about, where uh, local businesses trooped to a consultation for an open meeting of the uh, Gloucester County Council Traffic Committee. Um, there wasn't anyone from Cheltenham on that committee, which is just the way county councils work, because they're big institutions that cross the whole county. Uh, but every single person who spoke said this will cause a real problem for small independent retailers, because the choice isn't actually between turning up and either paying or not paying, it's between turning up and paying or driving off to the supermarket where there's free, countless free parking, um, and actually that is the thing that in the end will start to kill off local independent retailers. And in the middle of a recession, it seemed just like the worst possible moment to lay an extra burden on, on local independent retailers. Uh, they passed it anyway, and so it's now for me, I have to say, a bit of a campaigning issue, and I'm happy to take uh, stuff like that up. But there are levels of promotion that you can go uh, beyond those kind of uh, representational approaches as an MP, and you can actually plug a business. Um, now, you have to be a bit careful in this. There are some ethical and, and sort of, you know, uh, official standards that you have to follow, and there are strict rules about using Parliament and using the Port Palace um, in terms of promoting a company. But if I'm trying to uh, push, represent Cheltenham, and I have a business that for me is ethically okay, ideally doesn't have local competition, so I'm not promoting one local business against another, uh, and ideally has a good and outstanding record on something like the environment or corporate social responsibility. I'm pretty willing to, to shout about that business and to promote it. And there are various ways in which you can use your media profile as a politician to do that. So I was making a speech about recycling to a uh, Liberal Democrat conference, not this one that's just passed, which I'm just about recovering, uh, but a couple of years ago. And I thought, well, here's an opportunity. So I took a whole bundle of what looked like plastic cups and cartons onto the platform with me. And they were from a brilliant Cheltenham company called Cheltenham Catering Supplies. Sounds very mundane. And it was all recycled. It was made from things like uh, potato starch. Even the things that looked like plastic cups were, were from um, organic materials. Um, and they're a brilliant example of, of green product design that looks as good and works as well as, as more traditional oil or other based uh, products. Um, I went to um, the House of Commons a few times in various different capacities to, to push just the consideration of a local business. Um, so we have drunk battle man beer twice <laughs> in the House of Commons bar. Um, the, there has been a lighting test of Think Lighting's um, low energy light bulbs in the new Port Gunnis House, which is the new um, sort of swanky uh, new office block for, for MPs. Um, and we all got, all the other members of Parliament recently got an email um, from a brilliant, uh, well, actually, they got the email from IPSA, which is the new expenses watchdog, saying, if you want to office, order your office supplies in a new online ordering system that makes it really simple and easy, uh, and which we will um, sort of immediately pay you back through the expenses system and there won't be any complications, click on this link. And the link is to a Cheltenham company called Commercial. 
who developed that software platform and that ordering system, and it immediately put them in competition with the basically the monopoly that had been there for about 20 years, um, supplying MPs stationery. And I worked with them partly <coughs> because actually I think it's good to promote a Cheltenham business, and they had an interesting product. And actually, I helped them to look at the way they were pricing stuff and spot the fact that they were actually not very competitive with Banner when they first launched it. Um, and talk about you know, actually MPs aren't quite as rich as everyone thinks, and actually the expensive system isn't very generous now. So you have to just be quite competitive in those prices. But partly because commercial has a fantastic record on environmental issues. Um, the, but the government, we're very proud actually when we put an amendment into the Climate Change Act to set um, the UK corporately a target of reducing carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. Okay? So about a 40 year time scale. Commercial decided to do that in about three years, and they are on track to do it. And they have changed their whole fleet of delivery vehicles, initially uh, to uh, sustainable biofuels, now they're moving them to hydrogen power. They've got the biggest solar array in Gloucestershire on, their, on the roof of their offices. Um, they use, they've changed all their lighting to low energy and so on. So they're a fantastic company, and I was already in touch with them because of their environmental credentials and because of their, their excellent record on on corporate social responsibility. So I will definitely shout about and promote companies, that, especially if they have that kind of record. Uh, and I do think it is part of um, what an MP should be doing. And I think not think it requires that much alchemy, really. Um, and I think um, that if that means that I can work for you, or if you have a business that has something unique that is distinctive to Cheltenham, uh, that crosses a few ethical uh, boxes first. I'm afraid if you're a nuclear power company, uh, you're out, but otherwise I don't think we have any nuclear power stations in Cheltenham, I've noticed. Um, but if you are uh, any other kind of business and you, you tick those boxes, and especially if you're non-competitive and especially if you're, uh, you've got a good record on green issues and uh, social responsibility, then I will be very happy to promote you. And in any case, whoever you are, um, I will um, be happy to represent you when it comes to legislation and to uh, barriers to your business. And if I can give you one last example of how, um, even with my sort of campaigning hat on things like you know, the arms trade, uh, I sometimes have to gulp a bit, but I will represent that business. Um, a brilliant company came to me uh, just recently, and they said they were arms dealers. And I, I actually thought they were joking, to be fair, but they really are arms dealers, and they're based in Cheltenham. And they supply a very uh, respectable end of that market. They supply a shipping who are protecting against piracy. And they realized that the way the rules work at the moment, that you can gain export licenses for arms, but there is no process for getting those arms back again, effectively re-importing them if they are surplus to requirements. And so, uh, so they said they couldn't actually complete the business process in this country. And I said, well, what are all the others doing who are shipping arms out to, to shipping companies? And of course, what's actually happening is those arms at the end of the process go missing. And we know where they end up. They end up with the pirates, or they end up in East Africa fueling wars and being part of the illegal arms trade. So actually, although I did gulp slightly when they said they were arms dealers, these are the good guys. These are the people who are trying to do it in a very ethical and responsible way, and they've discovered a regulatory barrier to doing that. So I'm definitely taking that up with government and trying to get that barrier changed. So uh, you can go from cupcakes to to arms deals <laughs> and get your MB to be your business champion. If you're not one of my constituents, or if your business isn't based in my constituency, which is most of urban Cheltenham, then you should be developing the same with your MB as well. And uh, good luck. And I know I haven't talked at all about economic policy, because that wasn't what the brief was today. And I know there's a recession, and I know it's not all quite going according to plan. Um, and we're trying to sort that as well. But uh, in the meantime, in any way that I can, I will try and help you to do the best you can for your business. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just a quick question. My business partner met you, I think back in April, about helping grants business for export and yes. expanding businesses. I was wondering if there's any sort of, if there's any way, because it seems to be really tough for shelter businesses to access government grants. Yes, I know, and I, I remember taking that up, and I've, I've done it for others since. And I am, I'm quite frustrated, actually, and I've said this to Vince when he visited recently at how difficult it is to get that basic information. Now, um, because there are just too many different 
schemes going on and the criteria aren't clear and there seems to be no one place where you can find out about these things. And even, I mean, I have to say that applies all the way down to local level. I mean, I had somebody recently talking about the Promoting Cheltenham Fund, which was not huge grants, but, you know, thousands, uh, to help any business that helped to raise Cheltenham's profile. Um, so some festivals and some events have, have managed to get grants. I met somebody else who was doing Cheltenham Fashion Week who didn't even know that that grant <laughs> scheme existed. <coughs> So having a central, I will, I'm trying to gather um, a sort of central sort of resource of information on that, but I strongly encourage bids to try and do that. The other body that really has the brief, I think, to try and deliver that information, though, is the LEP. Um, and I was pleased that the LEP has replaced the combination of regional development agencies, which I think are so remote, um, based in Exeter, and too big, and too, bluntly, too bureaucratic and wasteful, and I don't have to say as a business it was a bit before I was an MP. And the business links, who I think tried hard and did, you know, made good effort, but I didn't always find them as useful as they might have been when I was in business. So I hope the LEP strikes the right balance, and I think it should be absolutely part of their remit to try and get that information on what grants and schemes are available to support business, and whether that's things like the New Business Bank and how that's going to work, or whether it's actual grant schemes. Um, yes, we will try to do that. But I'm sorry, I mean, I, the answer is it's not very good at the moment, it's true. It's really difficult. They just want yeah. to have your website protection when you're up front. Yeah. And you portray them as being a government agency which they're not. Yeah. And after that, it's really, really tough. What yeah. Well, I'm going to try yeah. and, I mean, yeah. if I can find the time and resources, I'm going to try and get onto my website some information for businesses and also look for some of these things for things that are acceptable. Well, on that note, perhaps one yeah. of the things I was going to talk to you about, um, talking about that, um, in the last 18 months, there have been two big schemes, the National Loan Guarantee Scheme, then the uh, uh, Funding for Lending Scheme, or yeah. whatever it's called, and apparently there's a new one coming up called the Enterprise Loan Scheme, yeah. um, and they all three fail in one big, massive way. The lending criteria is down to the banks, and mm -hmm. if that was the case in the first place, the banks are not going to lend, so they're not going to lend me even if the government are backing it, yeah. because I still don't hit the criteria. So immediately. Yeah, let's talk about that. And yeah. I mean, that could also apply to the new business bank, actually, if we're not careful. Yeah. yeah. Because Which that's also using the banks as a vehicle. So mm -hmm. it is good. It is a problem. And um, it, it, the only reason I, 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 mean, the only thing I can tell you is that Vince is acutely aware of the problem. Mm. Well, I mean, not when he came here, he, we talked, I mean, he came to a chamber event, and it was very clear that, you know, the banks basically are telling him one thing. They say they're lending and that their criteria are reasonable. But the Federation of Small and Businesses. Are every single out. small, medium-sized business he meets says they're not. Mm. <laughs> uh, and I know who I believe, I'm afraid. Uh, and I've had lots of examples in Cheltenham of people with very robust business plans, a good credit history, a good record of delivery on investments. And there's no reason why those companies, I don't think, are getting, are not getting investment. Well, the bank has never even looked at my business plan. No. And I think the pro I mean, it's a structural problem in the banking industry, really, that the days when you had an intelligent, well, it's not their own intelligent, but a, a local bank manager who had local intelligence, if you see what I mean, and who understood how businesses worked and could make a human judgment that this was someone he, he's known, someone who doesn't bullshit him and who gives him, you know, uh, a robust plan. And even if it looks a bit risky, well, that's something I'm willing to take a risk on because it'll probably get a return. That doesn't work anymore. Now they just turn to the Terminal, mm. fill in the criteria, yeah. and if the computer says, says no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's banks and the bank who said they were willing to help me immediately said no. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing Vince did say, and I'm now not going to remember the name of the bank. If anyone was at the meeting, this is terrible. I need to learn this by heart. He did say that one of the strategies Biz is using is promoting competition amongst banks and trying to promote alternative lenders. And he said there was one which was. Um, had a much better track record on lending. So if you come to me, I will ask him and try and get the name of that bank, but I'll try. I'll make feel it back to you as well. In the um, local enterprise partnership, they have a banking group, don't they? And right. they, so they've got, and I can't remember whether it's all the high street banks or some of the high street banks are all working together right. um, to help with small businesses. Yes. Well, that's so, a very good so, thing. So, you know, they've got, I can't remember, but they, you know, they've got that Western Lloyds and Barclays yeah. or, or whatever. Uh, all working together on one committee yeah. to, to work full glossary. But I think Vince's argument, this was a, a specialist business bank that had originated overseas and which was now in the UK. Mm -hmm. it's and it's Scandinavian. Yes. It's called Handel's Bank. Handel's Bank. Handel's Bank. That's it. Yeah. So, yeah. Try Handel's Bank. Yeah. 
they're very, they're very, they're very good. But Can BBC I play them as a Radio 4 program? But in the yes. process of moving back, so I want to destroy my red rating as well, which hasn't happened. Well, let's hope. I mean, this is another thing. I mean, there's another thing. British banks also, um, I don't mean this rudely, incredibly conservative sometimes. I mean, American banks, I remember an American banker telling me this, that they regard a business failure as a learning process. Yeah. And that if somebody's bankrupted themselves, mm. well, they were having a go, weren't they? And they tried, and they probably learned some serious lessons from that That's process, it. and they're willing to learn to them. That's the thing. Well, you trying working to get banks like to be lent to by a British bank, and it's hopeless. I would, uh, they actually offered me money in America, but because I don't mm. have green card, they couldn't help me. Yeah. Well, OK, well, let's try Handel's Bank, and if not, come back to me. German banks generally are much more affordable. Yeah. They sure tend to think long term, mm. rather than this, let's have a two-year business plan. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Probably one. Two years. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. 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 Lucky if you're making the money at all. Two years. Yeah. 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 Um, if someone's going to see the surgery, what's the best way to prepare? Do you get about ten minutes? Oh, I don't know. You see, I'm going to give you a test, and you can. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to prepare much. I mean, if you, if you're going to see him, you know about an issue. Yeah. It's helpful if you give us some heads up as to what the issue is beforehand, mm. just because you might get slightly more. Response from me. Uh, it's a long shot. But, yeah. um, so the way they're all booked appointments. So you just email or call up my office and get a slot. And if the Friday evening is impossible for some reason, if, if your business is a you know, if your you know, entertainment business or something that's working in the evening, then you know, I do make other arrangements as well. Uh, but but just get in touch and. and Come on a friendly basis. <laughs> if you haven't given me a briefing, you don't ask me lots of complicated questions. Um, but I'll, I'll just respond as best I can at the time. So some some briefing before that is a bit useful. That's the only thing. Okay, thank you. But if anyone's got any further questions, uh, no one might have no, a, a couple of minutes to hang. Okay, five minutes. Um, yeah. We could just wrap it up. Um, what I was going to say though is you're talking about contemporary cake designs, mm. which is quite coincidental because Xavier Palou, who runs contemporary cake designs, is speaking at our next skills space meeting, which we hold on the 9th of October. Is he bringing some product? And he's bringing some product. Look <laughs> 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 oh, now, I'll tell you, it'll be worth it. I've never <laughs> tasted his cakes, but I follow them on Facebook. Oh, and they have the die for. <laughs> make amazing cakes, which is why I asked them to breathe in and stand behind the lectern so, so you can't see out of your face. Yes, they, they look fantastic, yeah. so that's quite a good little playground for them. But um, I'd like to thank Martin very much for coming to talk to us. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.